So a lot of people I'm sure, and including myself are wondering how this affects Institute fraternity. Yeah. And I think article yeah. six, I'll, I'll just read it really quick. Institutes sure. of consecrated life and societies of apostolic life erected by the pontifical commission Ecclesia Dei fall under the competence of the congregation for institutes of consecrated life and societies for apostolic life. Yes. Um, I, you know, I regret to say, and I, I realize that, you know, I, I don't want to spoil, you know, everyone's day who's watching this. Um, but the, the fact is that the document gets worse and worse in a sense, as you go along. And this is one of the worst uh, provisions in it. Um, because up until now, a right, little historical snapshot here. Um, when Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated four bishops, and there was uh, and and there were excommunications um, that were imposed later lifted by Benedict the Sixteenth, of course. Um, at that moment, there was there was a kind of flurry of groups of priests and religious who came to the Vatican and said, "We don't want to keep following Archbishop Lefebvre. We want to be regularized. We want to be. We want to have perfectly." you know, cordial relations with the apostolic see. Could you please regularize us, but approve our constitution so that we can keep doing the traditional liturgy and all of the customs and way of life that goes along with that. And the Vatican was generally speaking, um, you know, open-minded to that solution. And in fact, carried through that solution with groups like the Institute of Christ the King and the Fraternity of St. Peter. I'm not saying that each of these groups started from Lefebvre. The fraternity certainly did, um, not the Institute, but, or at least as far as I as far as I understand, I could be mistaken about that. Um, the, but for example, the Sons of the Most Holy Redeemer, the so-called Transalpine Redemptorists, they also started uh, with with Archbishop Lefebvre and came back um, mm. to to the Apostolic See. Um, now, uh, because of that kind of unusual history and the way these these groups originated. Um, it was thought to be a good solution initially to just treat them separately, right? That, that, was, that was what the Ecclesia Dei Commission was. These are special cases. They need special treatment. And I, I mean special treatment in the sense of people who understand what these groups stand for, what makes them tick, why they love what they love. Not special in that sense earlier of like, these are lepers, they need to be kept separate from everybody, but more, more just like specialized, right? They needed a specialized situation. Um, and you know, obviously that wasn't going to be a, a great long-term solution, but it was a very good and sensible short-term solution. Uh, and that, that remained the case under Benedict the 16th who strengthened the Ecclesia Dei Commission, gave it much more authority. And then when Francis became Pope, right, he abolished the Ecclesia Dei Commission, folded it into the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith as a fourth section of it, as you know, like a sub-department. Uh, and now he's effectively canceling out that sub-department. I, I don't see how it could exist anymore. It has no competencies, mm. um, uh, according to the new motu proprio. I think it's just been basically vaporized, you know, with that atom bomb that we were talking about. Um, because what's happened now is the fraternity, the Institute of Christ the King, the Sons of the Most Holy Redeemer, many, many communities of nuns and monks, they're all going to come under the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies for Apostolic Life. That's that's the Vatican dicastery that is in charge of religious life in general, broadly speaking, and societies of priests. Okay, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? That seems logical. It would be logical if the Vatican wasn't absolutely crawling with modernists right now who hate tradition, but that's the world we're living in. It's 2021. Uh, and so this particular congregation is notoriously anti-traditional notoriously. So I, I don't honestly, I mean, ex apart from prayer and fasting mm. and like being on our knees um, right. day and night, I don't know what could come from this because they could try that they being that congregation could try to do a Franciscan friars of the immaculate on all of these orders. Right. What does that mean? Um, well, the FFI was a flourishing group of Franciscans. Uh, they were just booming in vocations and numbers that that uh, started out as a Novus Order community with an openness to tradition and over time became more and more traditional until most of their clergy were celebrating the Latin Mass exclusively. And early in his pontificate, uh, Pope Francis really stepped on them like a bug, right? He he pretty, I mean, he pretty much destroyed the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate, scattered them across, you know, the world to the four winds. Um, 
it was a terrible thing. I mean, I think a lot of people have forgotten about that because it's several years old. I hope, I hope if my readers don't know what I'm talking about, they'll go and find out what I'm talking about because that was a test case. That was like a pilot case for what could happen or what could be attempted, you know, by the by the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life. Um, I honestly, I pray that these societies and congregations will be, or these societies and institutes and religious orders, that they will be very strong, that they will fight hard against any encroachment on their rights. I mean, this is the time, this is the time for heroic witness. 